This should be um, lecture 22, 23. Have to check it up. I had to pull a couple shorter ones off. Um, urbanism and digital narratives after COVID. This is, again, getting into the sort of odd field of between urbanism, 6,000-year-old invention, collective invention, and the internet, which is a, well, mid-60s, 55-year-old invention from DARPA, collective also. So we have two massive collective endeavors that have changed our lives. Cities change our lives. Why? What motivated people going into them? Very important. And I'm going to try and speak without getting throttled here um, on the video. So just bear with me if I get throttled halfway through. Mysteries of your RAM and with a graphics engine. Yeah, it takes a lot of gigabit. Um, what else is interesting about that compare and contrast? We're going to get into digital narratives, physiognomy, infrastructure, reading the great book, Cities for 6,000 Years. Will cities survive after COVID, after the lessons of COVID, lessons of um, pandemic, lessons of an apocalypse, lessons of post-peak oil, lessons of rising um, ocean waters, lessons of diminished fresh water and above all lessons of this successful animal called homo sapiens which is now approaching 8 billion people 60 70 percent of which will live in cities with fragile infrastructure getting food in again i mention this almost every time it takes 10 calories of petroleum to get in one calorie of food into the cities so we're looking at the origins of um, what made people collect. Um, there's very simple remaining emotional um, uh, impulses. It's a place of spectacle. It's, we're a social animal. We get together socially. It was a culmination of a place. It was, um, uh, instead of being in the field, hunter-gatherers with nature, we brought nature inside. Um, they developed appropriate infrastructure from alluvial flooding, um, faster, more intensive ways to irrigate, uh, uh, greater labor, collectivized labor, um, specialist um, division of labors, um, and massive building projects. As I'm reading in the book on the Mesoamerican cities, they did not have beasts of burden. They did not have the wheel. So these massive pyramids were brought in on the backs of thousands, tens of thousands of workers. Who was feeding them? Um, what sort of natural or unnatural hierarchies developed out of this, um, this origin of cities? Ancient cities, what remains? Also, last kind of last point for young people, it was a way to reboot their lives. To There's a natural, may perhaps even subconscious impulse to diversify the uh, gene pool. Um, the, the, I talked about early forms of hominid cross-fertilization. We had, uh, we're down to 20,000 members of our species after the explosion of the Toba volcano in s roughly 70,000 AD in 40, 30,000, 40,000 years. Um, this one uh, hominid amongst already they found six, seven, could have been up to 20, 30 different species of hominids that did increase the gene pool by interbreeding with other hominids. At the end of that, there's only one standing. Still, there's only one standing. The Homo sapiens and the race, races of Homo sapiens, is race even a artificial idea? Um, um, all these are bigger questions. When we look at the cities, we look at the internet, and we look at bulwarking ourselves against the upcoming cataclysms. Another premise, um, and I have to give a little talk on how to make validly constructed critical argumentative blogs. I'm calling them blogs because they should be interesting to read. 
there's too much toxic and poisonous and just plain boring writing out there. Um, uh, I love scholarly writing, but so much of it has never seen the light of day because it's just wordplay. Um, and they don't form either facts or values. Um, they just sit there inert. Um, so for this class, I want very salient, critical commentary that has had an impact in your life out of COVID. You are your best anthropologist. And this is kind of what I want to see um, because I get bored easily. Um, an interesting uh, Socratic conversation is an ideal in the West, and it is a wonderful export from the West. Um, the ability to have two opposing opinions and make a third from the two opposing opinions follows predicate calculus, logic, modus ponens, if P then Q, P therefore Q, how to construct valid arguments. Um, in conducting versions of this class last semester, I would say, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people, and particularly young people, when you move, when you get rid of the social aspect, I'd say make a reference to your life, make, you know, make argumentation out of your life, put yourself, immerse yourself in it, and often got this, like, oh, it's too painful, I don't want to talk about it, I can't talk about it, well, what's the point of sharing? Um, we are a social communicative animal. Um, I know there are aspects that are too private, too much like an Oprah show, but the, I don't want that. We don't want that. Um, we want valid, well-constructed, insightful, adult conversation. That's all we have in this life to share with. Um, so much of life has devolved into ad hominem arguments to the person's identity rather than the argument stated. It's been a rough year. Um, for all, myself included. Um, so um, we want to have an open conversation. This um, talk is on the work I do in human computer interfaces, UX, UI, um, XR, extended realities. This actually, the colored silhouettes are influenced by neurosensors in the Mark Morris Center, affecting the um, colors around the forms, read by both the Connect which is an IR camera plus a neurosensor. Cool, right? Uh, you get a lot of information from just viewing these dance silhouettes here. Let's move onward. Um, out of the world of the screen and into the world of analog reality. What is the reality? Here's the world primary energy consumption. Oh boy. We have the United States, Russia, and China. There's India. Moving up in that realm of Germany. We have a um, number of states sucking it up. Um, in a world that is now used uh, 500 million years of stored um, uh, solar energy within 200 years. The rest of the um, developing nations want to catch up. Look at interesting Australia and Argentina. Um, look at Spain, f France, England there kind of moderate uses. That's kind of where we want to be in Mexico. North America is a powerhouse um, because of this. Um, but producing things China produces, that's their consumption. Moving on to world primary energy production. Mm, interestingly, let's go back, look at Saudi Arabia in the light blue, but look at that in terms of production. Uh, we have Venezuela and Brazil producing, we have Mexico producing, but over uh, America is, you know, location, location, location. North America, as it was sort of colonized by Europeans from the indigenous people here through, you know, brutality and genocide and all those other things that served to validate, um, was ideal land, it still is. Uh, ideal natural resources. It's gorgeous. The climate's just right. It hits that sweet spot. Um, that's North America. Um, moving onward, terrain and society. We have infrastructure in between um, these areas. Um, these are the things to determine uh, urban environments. 
um, coming out of the train. Do we live near a coastal area? Yes, I live in Brooklyn, but I'm on the tallest point of Brooklyn, perhaps even the tallest point of New York City. I'm 400, 300, 400 something above sea level. I look almost. I look across at the city. I'm almost the height of some of the taller buildings in downtown Manhattan. This 2050, we will begin to notice the rising effects on top of the tropical storms. Climate change appears to be a reality. Um, uh, but there have been other climate changes. There's actually been, as people, five previous extinctions before this. So nothing lasts forever. Certainly not this arrogant little homo sapien. Um, is this natural? Did the, the Homo sapiens soil their cage, thus making it unlivable for future generations? Probably yes. But um, it's, um, it's part of the, the procedure. Um, business as usual, dis dispersed city, look at the, uh, the upper left. left. Business um, outer, middle, inner. Central Business District, devoted to public art, public culture, downtown Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn. Um, Brooklyn's kind of an edge city. Brooklyn is, in some ways, more expensive real estate than now even Manhattan. Uh, it's no uh, surprise that with the rising post-peak oil, the amount of housing created in Brooklyn is predicated on the inability to find petroleum in the 1950s design, Levittown, suburban New York, driving, training, so forth. I have a reverse commute. I live in Brooklyn. I work at Stony Brook. Um, so I take the train, sometimes a car. Um, it's tough. It's worth it um, because um, in some ways, many people are getting over the, the vacuous, the emptiness of the suburban, suburban, uh, suburban, culture having no center of culture being diverse places now but with no center the the discussions as in revolutionary road i mentioned that movie a discussion about the emptiness of suburban living the emptiness of the man in the gray flannel suit commuting to the center city coming back not even knowing his family very sexist cisgender sexist opinion how many other forms the beatnik movement, the hippie movement, the, um, the uh, black movements of the early 60s showing the hippie movement, the war protesting movement, the second, third wave feminism, all these movements did in a way come out as a response to the physical infrastructural emptiness of the suburb, the car. The car is the detached alienated room. What the person in the special on Henry Ford said that the Model T allowed uh, uh, them an alleviation from the alienation of farmland now provides a strong sense of alienation. Paul Virilio, each uh, I'm a great fan of this kind of post-Marxist urbanist architect, social critic, who said every invention has its corresponding disaster. Um, the disaster of the airplane is the air crash. The disaster of the train is the train crash. The disaster of the invention of city is the fragility of cities. And so in the book 6,000 Years, perhaps it's even the fragility of cities that a population is interested in. Certainly Rome has been a very fragile environment at times. Its walls are public works projects, moreover, to colonize the interior labor, which two-thirds were foreign. And um, certainly, I live in New York, uh, definitely felt that when I was here on 911, uh, Hurricane Sandy, and, and certainly um, COVID, um, you know, 911, 3,000 dead. Um, Hurricane Sandy, a bunch dead infrastructure, billions of dollars. Um, changed and COVID um, last year about this time a little earlier 1200 people were dying a night of COVID I saw the refrigerator trucks there it is edge city is what um, American cities have become um, uh, uh, little edges like Brooklyn Queens developed out of the streetcar 
and remained. That's why we have so many beautiful brownstone buildings, which were formerly middle class, became during the suburban sprawl, became um, unfortunately so-called ghettos of, of people who could not leave the city. Ultra City is the modern city, probably cities in the southwest, Phoenix, uh, certain cities, New Mexico, not L.A. to a certain extent. These are more suburban planned cities. Um, my hometown, Minneapolis, kind of unfortunately became a place of ultra cities. It's on the prairie, so it can spread out. Unfortunately, there was not a lot of great um, uh, urban planning about the confluence between inner, middle, and outer reaches. There's no such thing except for the parkways and certain parks. We'll give praise to Robert Moses on this. Um, the, the beautiful parkways on the way out to uh, the Long Island suburbs, Stony Brook. Um, compact city, boom, usually by a physical environment, uh, favorite compact cities in America, let's say Savannah, Georgia, beautiful colonial cities, gridded out, compacted by what, the sea on one side and other things. It did not, fragile city, did not get destroyed in um, Civil War the way that Atlanta had been. Um, uh, I had a concert over here at um, uh, Greenwood Cemetery, uh, over 150 year old cemetery. 160 year old, 180 year old seminar. Um, a lot of monuments to the Civil War dead. Corridor City, um, developed first by, one could say Brooklyn is this corridor made by streetcars, now made by Robert Moses' um, uh, highways. Um, again, tenable, untenable, who knows? Edge City, Ultra City, Fringe City, um, Edge City, Ultra City, Quarter City, we're going to look at as ways of also integrating urban agriculture, mitigating the um, uh, effects. My neighborhood, Windsor Terrace, was a couple days ago in the uh, Wall Street Journal as one of the survivable neighborhoods of uh, during the COVID because we're kind of locked between a beautiful cemetery half the size of Central Park and uh, Prospect Park, two thirds the side of size of Central Park, and during my days, I would I bike every day. I would bike to the park, and it felt like I was in the country. I can still walk in the woods in Prospect Park, and feel like I'm in a woods upstate. It's gorgeous. So we'll talk about Edge City, Corridor City, Fringe City as being a kind of ultra city, as a way of retaining the cosmopolitan sense of a city, city of um, critical culture, um, Epicureanism, where you don't have to subscribe to kind of tribal or rural parochial sort of behaviors. Um, and so that's a, an important part. Going further, airspace, stories and levels. A friend of mine sold his airspace in downtown Tribeca for 70k of negative space uh, in order for them to put up a multi-storied um, hotel, getting money for free. Uh, kind of odd, but it happens in New York. Um, you pay for your locked-in vision. Um, here's again, think again as we advance. We're in week three of this course. Where, how, what can we mitigate the next disaster, which will be the disaster of petroleum? Petroleum has already created the, the disaster of climate change, I contend. Facts. Making values from facts. Um, dependent urban areas, called Central Hub, dependent urban areas. I'm a big fan of the museums, of BAM, of avant-garde performance, downtown, downtown culture, kind of cultural aspects of what usually populated every city, artists, um, culture makers, diversity, different races, collectivizing together, finding stimulation from each other. This is a notion of central hubs. This is traditionally not the place of dependent urban areas, upper left, satellites. Uh, moving on further, how can we retain that culture? How can we go to really nice restaurants? I was at one in Brooklyn, French restaurant, uh, Sunday. Um, 
how can we remain cosmopolitan when we know these factors? We know a city is a place of ideas. It's a place of diversity, not just for itself, but the way that we can take the best from each other and use it or not use it or live it um, or be stimulated by it as a part of being in the woods or near agrarian people or out in depressed small towns um, who often say, I always get this, I haven't gotten it for years, but I got it again. Going back to rural Minnesota and family, friends look at me and said, so how is it living in New York City? I'm like, how is it living here? I don't know. Um, less space, more expensive, but you know, you can't surround your own life with a bunker and assume that nothing will ever change. Time marches on, entropy marches on, the need for stimulation ideas and the need for fragility too. That's a, that's a lesson from Rome that it was a big, huge, impressive construct, the spectacles in the arenas, in the theaters, in just the pageantry, but that tended to point out the vulnerability. The walls alone took decades to build um, that did not fend off immediate dangers. They had to have standing armies. Romans seriously took that opinion, the best defense is a strong offense. Their armies were developed algorithms of, of battle history, battle mechanics, battle algorithms to a perfection. Um, they did colonize places, bringing in um, uh, good services, riches, in a pyramid scene that they offered parts of their empire. Parts of their empire did rebel. It reflected the core center. Uh, interesting case, the son of Marcus Aurelius did a lot to expand the empire. There's a great study of Commodus, his decadent son, which is base of that movie uh, Gladiator the emperor who fights in the arena because interesting aspect binary uh, because his wise philosopher soldier father stoic expanded the borders subdued the people mostly the germans and and some other rebellious people it's all a form of colonization anyway commodus was worried about his legacy so in a strange sort of applauding of Commodus, who becomes the emperor gladiator. He rigged all the fights, he poisoned or drugged his combatants, and you know, stories such as this, but and finally got killed in the ring. Um, uh, like in the movie Gladiator, um, loosely based on Commodus. Um, he did determine it's better to govern from the center. It's better to govern from the spectacle. And certainly our last president, 45, um, sought to create spectacle twice a day, counterproductive spectacle, inflammatory things, kind of taking a card from Commodus. Um, you can rule the peripheries from the center. That's an interesting part. So here, so here we have the central hub. We have networks, subordinate satellites. We have a linear city following, um, like in the Midwest, following train tracks or scant rivers. Minneapolis is formed on the Mississippi River with St. Paul. It's called MSP now, Minneapolis-St. Paul, um, as a center. Uh, segments, um, ways that highways, roadways split out, uh, forming variations. And here we'll, we'll stop. Uh, the lesson of Commodus, Rome at its top, million, million and a half, but so was Angkor Wat, so was Xi'an. I think the Chinese cities, a couple other cities had achieved that. They usually achieved by infrastructure, water, primarily. Uh, Rome was made possible by the infrastructure of plumbing. Um, just the banal thing, where do you put waste material? London, London, even until 1998, was depositing of sewage in the ocean. Um, New York City sits on over 100 year old infrastructure of sewage systems and you constantly see people just a never ending task of re, um, re um, patching up these things. We'll cut off this lecture here.